this episode of Skeptico. A show about what yoga is really all about. Inhale, arms up to the sky. Good. Remember, this is not a competition, although you two seem to be the best in the class. It's really important in this pose that you arch your back and keep it flat at the same time. I feel like those are opposing ideas. No, they're not, because you're arching your back up while it's flat. And what yoga is really all about. But it's a little more than a metaphor, because if we're taking information and we're actually rendering physical things around us, now that's a game and that's a simulation, but it's just so far more advanced. That's what Elon Musk was trying to say, right? No, I think they're saying something different. I mean, you can't have it both ways. If it's more than a metaphor, it's not a metaphor. I I go back to your definition of what yoga is. It's the cessation of the whirlpools of thoughts and feelings in the river of consciousness. You're talking about God and divine here, right, Mr. MIT tech entrepreneur, you're way past any kind of Elon Musk simulation. I think we get into this kind of backdoor materialism where we kind of want to have it both ways. That's part of it. But part of it is that we don't have the language (laughs) to express what these things really are. So we have to express them in language that we might actually understand. The first clip was from the movie Forgetting Sarah Marshall. And it has an appearance of Russell Brand, who I think is one of the most terrific people producing content on the planet at this moment. So that alone is reason enough to revisit that old movie. And the second clip was from today's guest, Riz Verk, who's written quite an amazing book about Yogananda, the author of Autobiography of a Yogi, one of the most important books for a Western yoga audience ever. That's kind of without even debate. So this was a really great chat with a really uh, great guy who's been on the show a couple times for very, very sharp. And I hope you stick around because I think you'll enjoy it. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality. Riz Verk is back. He's here to talk to us about his new book, Wisdom of a Yogi, Lessons for Modern Seekers from Autobiography of a Yogi. It's a really interesting book. Can't wait to talk about it. Riz, in case you don't remember, very, very successful tech entrepreneur from MIT, many VC startups, absolute pioneer in video gaming, founder of the PlayLab Startup Accelerator, actually on the campus of MIT. I mean, just kind of a major player and all that. And then goes back, gets a Stanford MBA because, well, why not? working on a PhD because, well, why not? And then uh, along the way, started writing books. He's probably best known for this one I have up on the screen, The Simulation Hypothesis. We talked about that a while back, but we're going to be talking about this one today, Wisdom of a Yogi. Riz, thanks for coming back. Thanks for being here. Sure. Well, thanks for having me back on. I've always enjoyed our conversation, so looking forward to it. Who was Yogananda? Well, so Swami Yogananda, you know, was born in 18, in the 1890s, I think it was 1893. And he came to America when he was a relatively young Swami in in 1920. So it was over a hundred years ago. And some like his biographer has called, have called him the first modern guru uh, because he was really the first Indian Swami or Yogi to come to the West and really establish a presence here. And he actually lived in America for most of his adult life. Now, there had been, you know, other Indian Swamis who had visited and had given talks and maybe opened a center or two. But Yogananda was unique in that, you know, he once he got here, he crisscrossed the country. He gave uh, uh, meditation and yoga classes and lectures all over the country, sometimes to sold out audiences of thousands of people. He was the first you know, yogi to be welcomed at the White House by President Coolidge. Uh, and so, you know, he, he came to Boston originally to give a talk at the World Congress of Religions at, um, back in 1920. And he ended up in Los Angeles and in Southern California. And, and then in the last decade of his life, uh, he ended up working almost exclusively on writing uh, his book, Autobiography of a Yogi which has gone on to become one of the top spiritual books of the 20th century written in English. 
and has sold millions and millions of copies. And it, basically it inspired a whole generation uh, of folks to learn about Eastern wisdom and about yoga and meditation, particularly during the 60s and 70s. So during the counterculture movement, uh, the paperback version of Autobiography of a Yogi was passed around probably more than almost any other book out there. And in fact, folks like uh, George Harrison from the Beatles, you know, he would have stacks of these books and he would just give them away to people every time he thought somebody needed a regrooving. And so it was a book not not with techniques per se, but it was a book about swamis and sages and yoga and its history and what it means. And it gave people a glimpse into, you know, this kind of wondrous land of magic that we might call old India today. Uh, Steve Jobs was a huge fan. Uh, when he died, it was the, uh, according to his biographer, it was the only book on his iPad. And at his funeral, according to the CEO of Salesforce.com, uh, he gave away these little wooden boxes. And when, uh, uh, you know, when they looked inside the box, there was a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi. And so that was kind of his last message and his gift to people. So it's just been tremendously influential over the years. And, and so has Yogananda. Um, and there's a yoga studio on every corner now in America. But when he got here, I mean, yoga was relatively unknown beyond a few stereotypes. And so you can credit him with at least uh, bringing the philosophy of yoga to the U.S. Okay. So super influential book at the time, Autobiography of a Yogi. And then there's kind of some strange synchronicity that leads you to become the author of this book published in India. Your whole background is kind of interesting, right? You were raised in a Muslim family. There's a lot of friction then and still today <laughs> between uh, Muslims and Hindis in India. And yet you're the guy selected to do this. Also, this book touched you deeply. It affected you from a very early age. You're into meditation. You're doing this. And then the Steve Jobs thing is, is interesting. I think way beyond, a, you're kind of downplaying a little bit. There seems to be this kind of strange, inexplicable link between Yogananda and technology. All these tech folks seem to be hooked up with Yogananda and not exclusively so, but I can speak for my own self as well and, and many others. So there's a lot to kind of unpack there. Maybe start with a little bit of your background and then how that led you to meditation and then how it eventually led you to this book. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I was born in Pakistan, which, of course, was part of India back in the time, you know, when Yogananda was alive uh, for most of his life. And they even lived in the uh, city of Lahore, which is right near where I was born and where we're from. But I moved to the U.S. at a very early age. So, you know, pretty much I grew up in the Midwest. And uh, during that time, I became interested in meditation and yoga. And, and I'm not, you know, uh, I should admit that at the time I was very ambitious. I wanted to become an entrepreneur. Uh, I was hoping to, you know, go to good college. And so I would look at these different meditation techniques and say, will this help me to have better concentration and to be more successful in my academic work or in my career down the road? And, and uh, but, you know, I, I didn't actually read Autobiography of Yogi. I'd seen it at the, the bookstore many times when I was in high school. Uh, you know, and back then it was like, okay, here's this funny Hindu looking guy with long hair and a robe. And I never quite, you know, I picked it up and browsed through it, but it never quite moved me until after I had graduated from MIT. And I actually became an entrepreneur. Uh, and, you know, for the next decade or two, I was pretty much involved in starting high tech companies first in Cambridge and then in Silicon Valley uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the area around MIT. And you know, during that time, I was living a bit of a double life, right? During the day, I would be working on my business. I would be a tech CEO, uh, and I would be out even traveling, giving talks on different technology ideas. And in the evenings, I would be reading books like Autobiography of the Yogi, and I would be going places like the Monroe Institute, you know, learning about out-of-body experiences. And so, you know, I, I, I kind of like to joke, my, my life was a little bit like, you know, w without the uh, being famous, a little bit like Shirley MacLaine, where she would like, in her book, she described in the 70s how she would fly to a city and do like a show, a dance on stage. And then the next day she would go visit a channeler, you know. And so, so you know, I had a lot of that going on. But I was recommended to read the book, uh, Autobiography Yogi, by, uh, you know, a, a meditation teacher 
uh, here in Boston, who was like a tall white guy. So it was just funny that he recommended to me that I should read this book. And that, I think, it shows the cross-cultural influences of this book, because oftentimes, uh, you know, this book was written in English, and now it's uh, become, you know, very popular in India itself. It's it's an example of what a scholar sometimes called a pizza effect. I don't know if you ever heard of that, where, you know, something like pizza originated in some small area, region in Italy, and then it came to the U.S., and it became a really big thing, and then it went back. Because the original pizza was nothing like what we think of as pizza now, but now in Italy the pizza looks a lot like what you know we think of as pizza here. And so anyway, that that was my background. And then you know, as you mentioned, uh, uh, I I ended up running a startup accelerator at MIT, and I actually had some health problems, and uh, you know I can go into those later. But during that time, I, I decided to refocus a little bit on my life on on my my writings, uh, and that's when I wrote the simulation hypothesis, which was. You know, based on this this idea that our virtual reality will eventually get so good it'll be like the matrix and we won't be able to distinguish between the two. And there was a period during that time when I was writing these books that you know, I couldn't do much. So I was kind of laid up on the couch. So I, I did what I do every few years. I read Autobiography of a Yogi again. And I said, well, I'm looking for other books that are kind of like this. And turns out there aren't that many books that are just like this, that give you these kind of tales of swamis with superpowers or what are called cities uh, in the ancient Indian traditions. And so I wrote a few blog posts about Yogananda and about uh, his uh, you know, about his book, his life, and other books that were similar from other Indian gurus and swamis. And then I just kind of forgot about it. I did it just because, I mean, I was sitting on the couch. I had not much much else to do at that point. And then I, you know, went on uh, with my writing and my I started my uh, PhD in academic career. And then suddenly, out of the blue, I got an email from HarperCollins in India. And, and they said, well, it's the 75th anniversary of when the autobiography came out, which was 1946. And they said, well, you know, we, we don't want to reprint it because there's so many copies out there, but we want to write a new book for a new generation of people who can about the lessons in that book. And we think you're the right person to write it. And I said, me, why do you think I'm the right person to write it? First of all, I'm not a Swami. Uh, I'm not even Indian from that perspective, right? I'm Pakistan, I'm a Muslim uh, and I'm a tech entrepreneur. Uh, and they said, well, because your books bridge the gap, you know, between the modern world of technology and some of these ancient ideas. And, and that's very true. In fact, I drew inspiration on Yogananda when I even wrote the simulation hypothesis. Uh, and so they said, you know, we want to be able to talk about these lessons with more uh, in a more modern setting, because, you know, his stories, which he, he wrote in the 30s and 40s, all took place in the early 1900s or late 1800s. Uh, and so, you know, we can definitely reinterpret them for today's readers. And so I, I ended up pulling in a lot of stories from my own life as an entrepreneur, as well as stories from other people I interviewed, college professors, students, entrepreneurs, Hollywood producers, all kinds of folks who were inspired by the book. And so, you know, w when that happened, at first, I didn't feel like I was up to the task. But then I realized I just had one of these strong clues, as I call them, which, you know, had this electric feeling that said, okay, this is a task that was put in front of me. And so it's a task that that I should actually accept, or like I like to say in a video game, it's like a quest. And so I ended up writing this book for HarperCollins India that came out there a few months ago and just came out now in the U.S. just, just this month. Riz, you define yoga as being about, let me make sure I get this, I love this, the ultimate definition, the cessation of whirlpools of thought and feeling in the river of consciousness. Explain that. Yeah. So today, you know, we think of yoga primarily in the West as the asanas or the physical postures. And what's interesting is at the time Yogananda wrote his book, and if you read his book, there's very little about asanas and physical postures. And when he built his organization and he taught thousands of people yoga, he was actually teaching a kind of meditation, right? And he did have some physical exercises called some energization exercises. And so I thought that was interesting. So I went back to, you know, his explanation of the Yoga Sutra, which was written by Patanjali a long time ago. I don't know, I forget what it was, at least probably a thousand years ago, perhaps. And if you read the, the Yoga Sutra, Patanjali talks about uh, the eight limbs of yoga. And only one of those limbs is the asanas or the physical postures. There's the yama and niyamas, which are like the do's and don'ts of being a yogi, right? Then there's like meditation, concentration, which are slightly different. 
there's pulling back of the senses, there's, so the, and there's pranayama, which many uh, practitioners of yoga may, may be familiar with, which is controlling your breathing to try to achieve certain results within your energy field and within your body. And, and so I went back to the original definition that Patanjali gave for yoga. I mean, the word yoga means yoke or union, but the definition he gave was much more interesting. He said, yoga, chitta, vrittis, naroda. Okay. And so I looked at all the, the translations of that and they kind of got the words. If you look at those words in yoga, chitta, they translate as mind stuff. Vrittis means whirlpool. And Naroda means to stop or to still, right? And so yoga was defined as the stopping or the stilling of these things called the vrittis. Now, what the heck are these things called the vrittis? Well, they say it's a whirlpool of chitta. What is chitta? I mean, these, these terms are really hard to bring into English, right? Uh, and so chitta is mind stuff. And so it's often translated as it is about the cessation of the whirlpools of thought. And so I looked at that and I said, well, there's a little bit more than just that. Uh, there's also like feelings and emotions. And in a lot of the translations to English, whether it's from, you know, Sanskrit, Hindi or Tibetan in the Buddhist traditions, we lose that. And it's just about the mind. But really, if you go back to the original words, it's about the fact that we get excited. We think about things. We have desires. We have fears. And when we do, all of these things are like little streams, little storms of these swirling whirlpools. Uh, and you can't really have a whirlpool without it being in something. And so that's why I kind of redefined it a little bit to say yoga is the stealing of the whirlpools of thought and feelings in the river of consciousness. Uh, because, you know, if you have a whirlpool, there's got to be a river or something that that's that's swirling. But a nice way to think about it is the snow globe, right? If you're in a snow globe, if you shake it, uh, the, the snow gets everywhere and you can't really see the scene. But if you just let it settle, you know, all of those things settle and you can see clearly. And that snow globe is like what the ancient sages called the kosas. The kosas are like our energy field. There are like five different kosas. And they these vrittis, these thoughts, feelings, desires that we hold on to all the time, they harden into the samskaras, which are imperfections in the field. And then eventually they become asanas or uh, they become tendencies. They basically, they become the karma, right? So there's a link between karma, future lives, past lives, and just stilling of the, the whirlpools of thought and feeling. And so any practice and this is my contention, and this is what I believe Patanjali was saying, any practice which stills the vrittis is a form of yoga. And, you know, that could be, you know, a prayer, whether it's a Christian prayer or Muslim prayer, that could be, you know, Tai Chi, that could be uh, different breathing exercises, uh, that could be simple meditation, that could just be going out by the ocean, right? in, in by the Pacific Ocean, and just letting yourself calm down. Anyone who's had a good physical yoga session knows that often at the end, you will do Shavasana, which is you know translated to either corpse pose or a translation I like better, peaceful pose. And you just lay there and you realize, for me, the realization was something is still, like something that used to be like this is now still there. I never knew what it was until I really looked into you know, this definition of yoga. So, so one of the lessons, there's like 14 lessons in the book. And one of the, the lessons is to practice every day, no matter how much time you have, you can practice yoga, as long as you practice something that causes a stealing of the storm of this mind stuff that's all over in our field. I think that's quite brilliant. I think your definition was very nuanced. And the way you explained it here will give people a little bit of an insight into the book in terms of there's a lot going on here with Riz and his experience with this spirituality. And I think that this also links back to this idea I have about the tech link, because one of the connections I kept making in your book is connecting it to the modern yogis that I really like and respect. And one of them I've mentioned to you before, Michael Singer, of course, the best-selling author, Untethered Soul, sold millions and millions of copies, Oprah kind of guy, but also a tech billionaire, at least at one point he was, actually, you know, PhD economics who gets a TRS-80 from Radio Shack back in the day and starts writing software, you know, 
he would give the exact same definition, although yours is even better, of how there is this energy moving through us and we are blocking it. So our whirlpools of thoughts and feelings are what are disrupting what is already perfect. And I, I think the way you laid that out and the way you described it right here is terrific. And I think it plays to this logical, rational aspect of yoga that I think you kind of just swim in naturally because that's your world. And I think a lot of people, when they come at it from a purely spiritual standpoint, they go, wait a minute, this is almost sounding too techy. But to people like you, you're like, oh no, there's this, and then there's some scars and that you leads to karma. And even though if it's not, even though if the language isn't perfect or it isn't, you know, at least it is, there's a logical, rational explanation for almost materialistic, but in a non, in a post-materialistic way, do you resonate with any of that in terms of your attraction to yoga in that way? Yeah. You know, I think there is this link between tech and tech entrepreneurs and yoga and, you know, Yogananda, one of the things that he did that was different when he was teaching yoga was he called it the science of religion. Right. And so even though he used a lot of religious language and, you know, he wrote and taught in the U S so, uh, a lot of his book, you know, uses biblical and Christian analogies, but in the end, he called yoga a science of religion. And that, I think, is what appeals to people who have, you know, more engineering uh, oriented minds or more technical minds. Now, that's not to say that everyone in, in the tech world is enamored with this stuff. But, you know, what's happened is, is as we've recognized the benefits, just like the, the physical benefits of yoga, uh, are kind of stripped of their spiritual significance nowadays, and it becomes just like a physical practice. Similarly, meditation has become popular now. If you go to Silicon Valley and a lot of big companies, you know they will have mindfulness as a key part of their you know HR department's offerings, like at Google. And you have many you know yogis and swamis who speak at talks at Google, for example. And of course, part of it, you know, there's a lot of you know, there's certainly a lot of folks who have come from India into Silicon Valley because it's the biggest kind of, you know, area for immigrants in the, in the tech industry. But part of it is, you know, we've seen the benefits of mindfulness. And so, so because of that, it's gotten wider acceptance, particularly within the tech industry, but pr probably because we do so much, you know, in our minds in the tech industry, right? So we're trying to break down things. We're trying to define, a, like, I remember when I was in high school and, you know, we had a TRS-80 in my uh, junior high school and my math teacher would let my, my best buddy and I skip the math lessons so we could like fool around with this TRS-80 and, and modify games. But I remember, you know, one, one day one of my uh, teachers asked, you know, what, what is a program? I said, well, it's a set of instructions in a logical order. And she said, yeah, except take out the logical order. It's a set of instructions, <laughs> right? And so I think for those of us who are trying to figure out how this stuff works, you know, it's very appealing in that way. And that, you know, ties to some of my thoughts about Yogananda and the simulation, which we can talk about, you know, whenever, whenever you'd like. Okay, we, we will, we definitely will. And actually, I'm kind of getting there because there seems to be attention throughout the book as to whether or not you believe all the stories as being historical and factual. And you've already laid a couple of things, written for an American audience, written to appease to a Christian sensibility. So I think this is fundamental, and I don't think you can dish it off too much. Is this allegorical? Is it factual? Is it fabricated? Where do you ultimately come down on that with all the stories as a whole? Take the whole package. Well, you know, there's a lot of stories that seem pretty fantastical to, particularly to those of us in the West. And even during the Yogananda's time, you know, he his relatives would be like, what are you doing wasting your time with this mystical nonsense? Like, get a job, there's technology, there's science, you know, there's all this stuff, railroads, uh, you know, motion pictures, there's all this new stuff going on. Why are you obsessed with the past? But, you know, some of these stories are about levitating swamis. They're about swamis that appear in two places. There's a story of a man who, of a Muslim uh, fakir, or holy man, who was taught by a Hindu yogi how to control a particular entity, like a jinn or what we would call a genie. And this, this jinn would actually take physical objects 
and the 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 guy his name is Afso Khan could say Hazrat, which is the name of the entity. Take that. And, but and then later when the guy's Afso Khan is not there, so they couldn't accuse him of stealing it, <laughs> Hazrat could just make it disappear and it would appear in another place. And so, you know, some people think of these stories as fiction, uh, as allegorical. And, and so I interviewed a lot of people, including Yogananda's biographer, as well as people who are devotees, who totally believe in these stories. And, you know, the, the most interesting interview I did on that was probably with you know, Diana Walsh Pasilka, whom you may know. Uh, you know, she wrote a book called American Cosmic. She's a professor of religion at University of North Carolina in Wilmington. Um, and, you know, she she's an expert in Catholic history. And she said that in her own life, you know, she read Yogananda's book when she was like young, like I don't know, five or six, because they had a copy at the house. She grew up in San Francisco, so they had like you know this kind of stuff. And she said that she believed all the stories. And then when she went into academia and she studied religion, so this was interesting for me, she said they teach you not to believe these stories, right? They say it's study religion as a sociological phenomenon, which basically means the miracles didn't happen, but let's study religion. That's just weird. That's just uh, yeah. the wokeness of modern religious studies has become. I mean, you can't take that seriously. Yeah. They, they have the whole postmodernism silliness. I mean, yeah. what Pulsolk is saying there, I have the quote actually from your book. The question of whether they're real or not may be beside the point. I completely disagree, but I'd like to hear your opinion on it. And I'd like to really kind of hone in on whether or not you believe that all the stories add up to being historically accurate. And I, I just don't yeah. see how they can in the sense of when you even say it's westernized or it's written for yeah. a Christian audience. I mean, that immediately kind right. of puts you over the line. And then right. let alone the fact that if we if we do go and read his biographer, he isn't doing quite the same kind of stuff when he's over in the United States. And he still is doing right. enough miracles, I think, for us to be interested in what lies beyond these extended consciousness realms. But it doesn't bode well for taking the stories as factual accounts, as historical accounts. So, well, well, let me just finish with the Vasaka story. So then she said that later she, because she's a scholar of Catholic history, she was given access to the Vatican's private library. And she basically read the canonization records of Joseph of Cupertino, who was you know, supposedly floated. And she said she saw the records of the devil's advocate, right? The person who was supposed to disbelieve this stuff and prove that this was wrong uh, and that he's not a saint. That, that, and she said she saw signatures of like a thousand people saying they all witnessed this, right? And so she's come to the conclusion that, well, maybe these things might have happened, right? That it's not so... It's not so, uh, you know, left or right, uh, or yes or no. <laughs> it's not so, you know, black or white in that sense. Or like Fatima, where, you know, 70,000 people uh, claim to have seen weird things in the sky. Or like modern UFO encounters, that these things may have happened. So as I went into it, you know, I, I used to, uh, one, I believe some stories and not others. And I think, you know, that that's sort of where I came out in that, what I found was that some, he, the Yogananda went to a lot of effort to try to show the provenance of these stories. So, for example, the guy who controlled the jinn, who would like take these material objects and make them disappear. Uh, he was told that story by his guru, Sri Yukteswar, who he trusted. And Sri Yukteswar told him because Yogananda was in a dormitory in this little town called Serampore, just outside Calcutta. And he said, in this room, I witnessed this myself, right? And I witnessed not just Hazrat taking things, but getting things falling from the sky that were like a huge feast. Now, you know, of, of a huge feast of meals from somewhere with golden plates that eventually disappeared. And, and that guy, Afzal Khan, became kind of a, what they call a terror of Bengal. Like people knew about him in North Bengal. And they're like, stay away from that guy because... You know, he'll like steal tickets or jewelry, but he won't do it in front of you. So nobody could ever charge him. Now, what happened with Afzal Khan, though, is interesting. Uh, and, and this is where we get to the allegorical part of the story, too. Uh, he, eventually, the, the guy who had taught him the technique found him and realized what he was doing. And he tested him and he said, you're using Nazrath for your personal gain. And that's not why I taught you these techniques. Therefore, I release Hazrat from you. 
right? And so then he could no longer control the jinn or the genie, except for, you know, certain things like when he needed food. And he issued a public apology. So theoretically, one could track down this. It was in a newspaper in Bengal. You could track this down if you really wanted to. Now, what I found interesting about that was, you know, first of all, the colorful story of the jinn and the genie. And, and so I started to say, are there other things like this? other stories of this happening that, that people you know might verify. But also when he gave him the powers, he said, this is because of your good karma, but you have a tendency uh, to be avaricious, right? <laughs> to, to be greedy, if you will. So be careful. And of course he wasn't careful, right? And so now imagine if you were you know playing a video game, to use that analogy, and the test was, will you be greedy? the engine would give you the ability to do something like this, where you can automatically get whatever you, you want to see if you're going to be greedy. And so isn't it interesting that here is the story that's actually as much about karma as it is about miracles, the karma of the, the particular guy, Afzal Khan, where the universe manifested for him a strange way to test specifically what he needed to work on in this life. And in this case, he failed the test. Uh <laughs> if you will. And so you could you could imagine someone having made up that story <laughs> in order to teach that lesson. And yet at the same time, like I said, Yogananda went to great lengths for the promise. So I asked around of my relatives, right, in uh, Lahore. And I said, look, are there any stories? Because we used to have random stories of jinn, but they were more like the boogeyman type stories, like, oh, don't go out there and you know, don't pee on a tree because there might be a jinn there. And if you pee on them, then they're gonna like possess you, right? And 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 we found this story that took place in Lahore. So there's a very famous tomb of a saint uh, called Data Darbar in Lahore. Uh, it's like one of these big, like, you know, very big tourist area. And underneath it, there's two other guys buried there, one of whom is a white guy from Britain. And, I, and, and so the story of this white guy is he went there and said, uh, you know, there's something I don't understand about these Islamic stories and the Quran and even the biblical stories. Like, you know, the Queen of Sheba, you know, she came here and Solomon supposedly was controlling a jinn and her throne arrived before he, you know, before, uh, before she did. How's that possible? The throne was big and she didn't bring it with her and they didn't have a caravan. And so this guy, the British guy was like, if anybody can answer me that question, I'll convert to Islam. Okay. <laughs> here, if any, like, you know, uh, bearded, uh, imam right and so he goes to the data darbar tomb because somebody told him go there there's a bunch of like these sufi guys there right who maybe can answer your question and he, he runs into this bearded sufi guy and the sufi guy says okay i'll tell you the answer but first i want you to drink some tea and he says oh okay or, or something you know what do you want to drink he goes i'll have some tea he goes okay sit down and he goes and he, and he goes like this and in his hand he materializes like a cup and saucer he gives it to the guy and the guy looks at the saucer and he almost faints. He's like, wait a minute, this is my cup and saucer from England, right? And I'm sitting here in Lahore. And you and, and then he goes back to ask the guy about it and the guy disappears. Now, what the heck happened there? That's very similar to other stories that I've uncovered about the, about some people with gin and how things move from London to here. And 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 this guy is very he became a Muslim. He lived there his whole life, and he's his tomb is there. Right, you can go there and see he's one of like two or three people buried in this this very interesting area, and so you know it, it's stuff like that that makes me think these are more than allegorical uh, that these things could have actually happened. Now, is there a guy named Babaji who has lived a thousand years, materialized, you know, up in the Himalayas, and he still looks twenty four, twenty five, you know? So I I said, well, are there other references to this guy besides just Yogananda? Right, and I found some. Uh, you know, I found a guy named Sri M who who claimed to his his guru was a guy named Mahesh Warnath. He called Babaji as well. But he said that Mahesh Warnath, whom he met in approximately 1960, I'm doing some math, uh, uh, was the same guy that brought yoga's guru's guru, Lahiri Mahashai, to this palace. We'll talk about this palace in another time for initialization, uh, for initiation. And that was 100 years earlier. It was in 1860. And he was still, you know, teaching him at that point. And then you have guys like Trilanga Swami, who's actually very well known. And, you know, Yogananda would say things like, you know, he was 300 pounds and he walked around naked in Banaras and everybody knew him. 
at one pound for each year because he was almost 300 years old. And then, you know, I went and looked at the sites and places dedicated. And there are references to him being 280 years old when he died in the late 1800s and with some records that, you know, from the British British folks. So it was just it was just really interesting. So I came to the conclusion that these things could be happening. They are like superpowers, but, uh, you know, and this this ties to my theory around the simulation, why I think these things could happen. Now, do I believe every story? Now, Yogananda was a great collector of stories, right? In fact, that was, his, in addition to being a child prodigy of spiritual techniques, which he very much was, he collected spiritual techniques. He tried a lot more even than what are listed in the autobiography. And you have to like read his biography from his brother and these other biographies to see all this crazy stuff that he used to try as a kid, which reminded me of things I used to try. But, I, but his real talent, one of his real talents was collecting stories. Whenever there was a saint that could do something amazing, he would be there in Calcutta and he would see them or everywhere he went, he would collect these stories and he would, you know, recounted these stories decades later in detail. I mean, it's amazing to me how he did that. And those stories are meant to inspire. They're meant to open up a Westerner's mind that in a physical world, miracles are still possible. So that's kind of where I came, where I came out is I think some, some actually happen. <laughs> and some maybe Chris, Chris, do you yeah. realize you just kind of went full circle there again, as you do in the book, which is. Terrific, because I think you're really struggling with it the way that every reader of this, Western reader at least, has struggled with it since the time they first got it. It's like he is very meticulous in terms of documenting the origin of these stories and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it does look like so much of what we've come to understand as spin a little bit, you know, as telling right. a good, as motivation. A good speaking yard, right? A little bit. <laughs> yeah. But I really, I really want to hone in on this. It's kind of a, a, a sticky point for me. I, I love Diana Walsh Pasolka. Her book, American Cosmic, is super important. She's been on the show. A uh, lot to go in there, and maybe we'll touch on that at the end. But no, it, it's not beside the point. It is the point. And it is the point two ways. You know, quick story. I remember several years ago, I was interviewing this guy, it kind of becomes the punching bag now on the show, but he's at Ohio State University, religious studies guy, and he's written a book on Scientology. And he's saying, I've thoroughly researched this. And yes, L. Ron Hubbard really was in the desert with Jack Parsons, and they really did this ritual to bring forth the horror of Babylon to bring forth the Antichrist into this world. But it doesn't really matter if that's real or not. It only matters that they believed it. And it's like an exaggerated point to your point, which, because I kind of said, well, you're just completely wrong. Of course, it first and foremost matters beyond all else, whether there is any possibility that this is real, whether there are any extended consciousness realms in which these entities can exist and can affect us down here. That is the question. That is not beside the point. That mm. is the point. And then maybe another just quick story from an interview that I just did, and everybody knows this, but we kind of forget this, is that yeah. it's the same problem we have with the Bible. I mean, there's stories in there, and we're told that some of them are allegorical, but we're told quite definitively from religious scholars that some of them are historical. And some of the main stories, like, and the one I always pick out is also Pontius Pilate. So Jesus right. is doing the sit with Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate, who is deep state, right? He's Roman. And he says, man, I can't see anything wrong with this guy. And he goes to those darn Jews out there and they're hammering. No, you got to kill him. And he goes, I wash my hands. And what do the Jews say? Let his blood stain our people now and forever. If you believe that that story is historical, you got a real problem. I mean, how can you not be anti-Semitic? And also, if you look at that story from a historical perspective, because history is important and we have to understand history and try and put it in context, how would we possibly believe in any way that that story, it just, it, it doesn't ring true in so many ways. So two points. One, I think it is the opposite of beside the point as to whether or not these stories are true. But number two, I think we have to, hone in on where there is exaggeration. I think you do a great job of explaining why and how they might've been exaggerated, but I think we got to know that. I mean, I think that's a key part of this. What do you think? Well, I, I do think that 
it's not entirely beside the point, you know. I mean, I asked people, okay, is does this is there a guy named Baba G? Which, by the way, you know, when I read that name, I was like, well, that just means you know, honored father. Right? Baba means father. G is like an honorific you give to someone, like Yogananda G, or you know, I, I might say Alex G, right? <laughs> it's uh, and and so it's not a real name. Uh, and they, and many of them said, well, that's sort of beside the point. It doesn't really matter if it is or is it. Did did Yogananda just use this you know this mythical figure who lived hundreds of years in the Himalayas as the founder of of his lineage in order to get credibility? Uh, but but that's why I went to look for other people who might have seen him, and that and I call river yoga a river, right? Because there's so many tributaries and so many branches that it's very hard to find what is authentic and what isn't authentic. And and so for me, it, it is important, but uh, it, that these things uh, are possible, right? But stories do get exaggerated over time with followers. I mean, did Buddha's mother really give birth without any pain standing up in the field like it's, you know, told? Well, that was 2,000 years ago. Probably she had some pain <laughs> while she was giving birth to the, to the Prince Siddhartha, who would later become the Buddha. That doesn't detract from, you know, my belief that the Buddha did have mystical experiences, and he did, he did basically become awake. He figured out that this whole world was a kind of a dream. And so you can see you can have both of those in the same overall tale. It's, you, you've got to be a little bit careful when you have followers and devotees who build up or accept every specific thing. And the Bible gets even more fraught, you know, because when you look at who are the people that compile these stories and where did they come from and things like that. So, you know, uh, but, but, but for me, I, it is important to that these superpowers, you know, one, that they have a lesson uh, and two, whether they actually occurred or not. And, and I've come to believe that many of them could have certainly have occurred. I don't think it's like, I'm not a Western materialist in the sense that these things just didn't happen. So for example, I interviewed another professor of religious studies. This was for my UFO stigma in academia study. I was studying why academics have such a stigma around studying UFOs. And they said, either in social sciences or in the hard sciences, but they said, they use the term that's been popular in the media recently since the recent UFO disclosures, you know, which is this ontological, right? There's been this term ontological shock, which John Mack certainly popularized. I don't know if he was the first one to use it with experiencers, but people are experiencing too much ontological shock with these stories of not just craft in the sky, but the U.S. government has these UFO craft, right? But basically they said it's okay as a scientist, social scientist, or a professor in the academy, respectable professor, let me put it that way, to treat UFOs as a sociological phenomenon, right? It's okay to tell the history of the UFO groups or of Scientology or these other groups, but it's not okay if you cross the line and say this is an ontological phenomenon, which means that this is a real thing. And they said, then you've crossed the line, you've kind of gone native, you've gone rogue, right? You're off the reservation, if we can call it that. And so he said, that he studies Christian, early Christian theology. And, and he says, you know, he, there's only two types of people who study early Christian theology. The people who say it didn't happen because it doesn't happen today, therefore it didn't happen then. And then the people who say, who are Christian, devoted, and say that it was God who did the miracles. And he said, what if there's something in between? What if they actually happened and it may or may not be exactly how it's presented to us in the Gospels today, but that, you know, many, many people saw these miracles. What if there is some ontological reality in some other way and some other laws? And that's what I like about yoga, because in yoga, these cities or superpowers, they are part of the tradition, but they are also, uh, you know, sometimes stumbling blocks, right? They're stumbling blocks to our spiritual progress. So it's an interesting tradition in that way and they really go and patanjali lists a whole bunch of different cities you know in his yoga sutra and he says yes these things may happen pay attention to them but don't get too obsessed with them and and that's you know the story of the jinn is a perfect example of that right <laughs> it shows you uh, but but if you fundamentally believe that this is not all there is which is you know i'm quoting from battlestar galactica here it says uh, you know, the Cylons believed in some in, in a God and they say, what is the most basic article of faith? That this is not all there is. And that pretty much describes every religion, right? The, the most basic article of faith is that this is not all there is. Then you have to accept that there might be other beings and other planes of consciousness that we can't see, and whether it's shamanic, 
it's Judeo-Christian or it's Hinduism or Buddhism in the, in the Eastern traditions of a soul reincarnating. Uh, they all believe that there are these other planes of existence. And, you know, in the Islamic traditions, the jinn play, play a pretty, uh, uh, you know, central roles in many, in many in their cosmology anyway, as other beings who exist. So, so I, I have come out where I think, you know, many of these things may happen. They may happen in ways that we don't understand. I mean, if you have objects going from London to India at the time, which, by the way, I found other references to interesting stories of the same kinds of thing, and it's usually a jinn involved who, who is doing it, that I consider to be a little, you know, relatively credible, although you never know because we weren't there. But if that happens, then there is something beyond what we can see. Uh, we don't know exactly how it works. And so, you know, our science, which is not that old, really, when you think about it, just doesn't understand how a lot of this stuff works. We think we know like 90% of the laws of physics, right? Yeah, the, we don't know 90% of matter, but we know 90% of the laws of physics. It turns out it's more like 3% or 5% in my opinion. And a thousand years from now, we'll realize that this stuff could have happened, that the theological interpretations may not be the exact, they may have been exaggerated. They may be extra theological to make their own traditions look good, but that doesn't mean these things couldn't have happened. That's really the point is what you just hit there. What is Samadhi? Uh, well, you know, so samadhi is a, a superconscious state as defined within the Hindu Swami traditions. And, you know, uh, that is the goal of many of the esoteric practices and many of the yogic practices is to get to samadhi, uh, which is basically you know, the goal of you know, the word yoga is union. And so samadhi is union with the divine. And so, you know, at one point when Yogananda was younger, he asked his guru, do you promise to show me God? And he says, yeah, yeah, I promise to show you God. And then, you know, a few years later, the Yogananda, a young Swami, who was very impatient, was like, well, I still don't know God. Can you show me God? And he went up to him and he touched him, like somewhere around his heart. And Yogananda felt this, this kind of warmth and this joy. And then he got into what he calls, or what I like to call a little Samadhi, right? Which is like an experience of the big Samadhi, which is he got into the super conscious state where he could see everything that was going on around him, you know, even beyond the walls and down the street. And, but he felt this love, this indescribable bliss and love. And, you know, he stayed in that state for a little while and then he came back. Uh, and then later he asked his master, well, when will I meet God? <laughs> and his master says, well, did you expect a guy with a beard? That is, you know, that if you can get to that state, you basically are becoming one with God because of the, the love and the compassion. And so, you know, I found this an interesting description. Now, there's other descriptions for how do you get there? You move up the kundalini energy, up the spine, up the chakras to the crown chakra. And once you get there, you get to what's called this breathless state. So in the yogic tradition, samadhi is, is associated with a breathless state. It's also within the Buddhist traditions, you, you know, they don't focus so much on move energy up the spine, right? They do it more from a, uh, you know, meditation point of view. And uh, interestingly enough, it, it gets back to the definition of yoga that I talked about earlier. Patanjali came later than the Buddha. And the Buddha said, you know, that if you, if something is subject to arising, it is subject to cessation. That's it, right? I mean, that is the same secret of yoga. If so, stuff comes up and we build up this stuff and all of our karma is based on all this stuff that we do, our actions and our thoughts and our feelings, like that is the fun. So they take a very different approach. So they don't necessarily talk about, they talk about nirvana as the term that's used, but for we, you know, we use enlightenment in the West for this, this kind of a state where you can remember you can remember that you, everything is just a dream. And so, you know, I, I was actually, I looked around and I interviewed some guys. There was, a, there was a guy named Ryan who runs a website called Kriya Yoga Online. And he was a disciple of a guy named Roy Davis. And Roy Davis was one of the direct disciples of Yogananda. And there's a few of these guys who went off and started their own organizations like Swami Kriyananda, started the Ananda Foundation, Roy Davis went off and helped start the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment in San Jose. And, and, and he says when, when, when Roy was younger, you know, he was like a young, young buck with Yogananda trying to learn these spiritual techniques. Yogananda was with another guy named James Lynn, who became the leader of SRF after he died. And he was one of the few that Yogananda said could achieve this spiritual state. 
And he, he asked something and, and Yogananda said, wait, what, what, did, what did you ask? And, the, and, and a young Roy says, well, I want to, I want to get to Samadhi. And he looks over, Yogananda looks over at James Lynn, who became kind of a, kind of his buddy in a way, even though he's a disciple. And he laughs and he goes, he wants to experience, experience Samadhi. And they both laughed. And then later, when, when he was alone, he went up to Roy Davis and he did the same thing. He like touched him uh, on his heart and he felt this indescribable wave of love. And, and that's where it's interesting because I think sometimes we miss that in the English definitions of this stuff. We're talking about how it works mechanistically, our thoughts and stealing our thoughts. But when you do, what's beneath is actually this light uh, Yogananda talks about the world being of light and then the light of the creator, which is what sustains and creates this world, which also comes with love and compassion. So you can't separate the emotions from the thoughts. And we try to do that because that's the Western tradition, right? Western uh, tradition is materialistic. We, 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 there's the, the thoughts and then the body and then there's the feelings, which are just chemicals in the body anyway, right? But but in the yogic traditions, they're all kind of interwoven together, is, is what I was able to, to, to glean from all this. Again, man, you're bringing it now. Because, like, this does really back to the earlier point, though. If we break it down logically, what we want to know with yoga is, is it true at a fundamental level that you're talking about here? Not in not whether particular stories are true, but whether the supernatural part of it is real. Whether there are these extended consciousness realms and then what are those extended consciousness realms? And now let's return to Mr. Riz Verk's definition, because I think this it, it, it's much more profound than it might have seemed. And it seemed pretty damn profound from the beginning. So if Yogananda is telling us that samadhi, which again, from the scientific standpoint, is something we can kind of say, okay, this is a real uh, phenomenon. It happens in this world, right? And there's tons of contemporary accounts of people experiencing it exactly the way that you said. And then we could have process how we would process accounts and the fact that experiences do matter. You know, we do take those into account with people, whether you're having grief or depression or joy, those are experiences and we do count those in science. But so he's saying, Yogananda is saying, Samadhi is love and merging with God and the divine in the river of consciousness. So now back to your definition of what is yoga, the cessation of whirlpools of thought and feeling in the river of consciousness. So now we can substitute that back in like you just did. And I think we really see where you're going with this. So you're not trying to play some middle ground, phony, materialistic kind of trick, like maybe it really is just... No, you're saying it's about merging with God and divine. Get over it. I don't even have to know what that means completely, what God and divine is to say there's all these accounts that that is possible. And the way to get there is the kind of stilling the water from these whirlpools. And I, I think you already said that, but I just wanted to put an exclamation point on it. There is, you know, you live in two worlds. You have your whole life because you wanted to be an entrepreneur. That was important to you, not only on a personal level, but I'm sure on a social level, you're an immigrant. You never at any point play uh, the race card in any way. Yogananda doesn't seem to be playing the race card in any way. And if anyone deserves to, you can only imagine what he experienced. But by the same token, you had to experience all that, you know, coming over here, an immigrant and your parents being immigrants and all that stuff. There's kind of a lot to unpack there in terms of how you do have to kind of play it straight for all your MIT friends and your VC friends and all the rest of that stuff. That does come through in the book. And I think it's it's totally legit. I, I, I get it. But do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, sure. I mean, that is something that I think, you know, those of us who live in two worlds, right, sometimes have to do. And I would say I did that more in earlier in my career when I was more worried about my career, right, as I would keep the two separate. But, you know, I was recently at Rice University with Jeff Kripal, uh, whom you, you may know. And, you know, he, he, he writes books about superheroes and, and impossible experiences in the archives. 
he ordered he organized the archives of the impossible which has all of whitley streber's letters which are like you know thousands of letters and uh jock valet's letters are there now john mack's letters are going to be there as well i think they're still working on those but but he you know he talks about the clark kent versus the superman <laughs> side and he says you have to show the clark kent side to the world particularly in academia in order to you know have a respectable job because you know they want clark kent but if you're interested in these other things like superpowers etc you know you don't necessarily show that up front but you have to have enough of both when you're teaching this stuff in order to be acceptable but one of the reasons why i wrote uh, the simulation hypothesis and is because I felt it bridged the worlds in a way that other things, other models of the world don't. I mean, it's hard to go, you can go to physicists at MIT and say, well, let's talk about what it would mean if the world was a simulation. You can also go to, uh, you know, Buddhist monks and talk about what this idea that the world is an illusion and how that relates to this idea of a simulation. And so you can actually bridge using this metaphor, uh, you can bridge these different worlds together. And, and that was part of the reason why I wrote that book was because it was bridging my different worlds, which is the world of video games, the world of science, you know, the world of like spiritual seeking and the world of science fiction. And you kind of pulls it all together in a way that uh, you can have an intelligent conversation. And there are folks who, like when Nick Bostrom first proposed uh, the simulation argument back in 2003, there were many atheists that went to him and said, well, you know, I, I was a staunch atheist, but if the world is a simulation, anyone outside the simulation, anyone who's like a, a programmer or a super user would look to us like it's supernatural. So maybe at least it's possible, right? Whereas before they were just like these staunch atheists who are like, no, that's it. It's not possible that there's anything, uh, any of this stuff could ever have actually happened. Uh, but yeah, in my own life, you know, I when I, when I was younger, I, I probably hid it a lot more than I do now. Now I'm just kind of out there, right? I'm a little bit older. Also, you know, went through. Uh, uh, yeah, certainly, you know, there was a little bit of that immigrant story and being in a, in a minority and, and how that affects you when you're growing up. And you know, even after 9/11, but by then I was well on with my career, and 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 so, you know, I, I don't think that that affects me too much these days uh in, but but in fact if anything i'm kind of i've kind of returned to my roots right i grew up in the west and so i was very you know very western oriented but i started to explore more uh, of the india and pakistan and the sufis and the islamic traditions now as well so yogananda was a bridge between east and west right and there was a there was a, a swami that he used to go to the levitating saint, he called him. But funny thing is, a lot of lessons that he taught Yogananda had nothing to do with levitation, which he ascribed to a specific kind of breathing technique, forceful breathing called Mastrika. And, and he said that to, to a young Mukunda, which is, you know, Yogananda's given name was Mukunda Lal Ghosh. And he said to a very young Mukunda who would just go and visit the Swami, and all his dour followers were like, why do you let this kid come in who just sits around and laughs at all your stories and stuff? And you know, he said to, to Yogananda that he was getting letters from America and they were curious about yoga. They're, they're rediscovering India, but much better than Columbus did, right? Because Columbus thought he was going to, <laughs> he thought he had arrived in India when he had actually arrived in the West. And so, you know, Yogananda came from India, brought his the, the teachings here, became more of an inspiration here. He was actually better known here. And now he it's like it traveled backwards, right? I mean, when you said for Westerners, who might be skeptical. Well, you've got modern Indians who are the same way, right? Uh, you know, uh, Rudyard Kipling had that line about East is East and West is West and neither of the twain shall meet. Well, except that these days, you know, you can't say the West is material and the East is spiritual. I mean, there's as much materialism you can find, as much business, as much technology you can find in India or China in the streets of Shanghai or in Bombay, as you'll find in Los Angeles or New York. And so the world has become, you know, much, much more integrated in that sense. But there are still these these philosophies. Uh, and, that, and that's, you know, I find my role in life a little bit to, you know, to try to, to bridge these different worlds. Because uh, e even though East and West have been bridged, the philosophies themselves haven't been bridged that much. Who is Daniel Brinkley and what did you learn from him? Uh, so Daniel Brinkley, he's a guy who got struck by lightning 
back in all the way back in like 1975, I think it was. And he wrote three times, uh, I think. yeah, three, three times. times and right? He's been dead. Yeah. He's been dead like four times now. And I mean, you know, uh, like when I went through some some heart issues, which I'll talk about in a minute, he was going through some. So we were on the phone talking, you know, about that. But but he's been dead almost I think four times now. And it, you know, when Raymond Moody was putting together his his book about near-death experiences, you know, I guess Daniel met him somewhere in North Carolina or South Carolina. And, you know, Raymond described, realized that his near-death experience had, you know, many of the different stages, the the, the commonalities across near-death experiences. Uh, and for me, I, I first heard about Daniel through his book and when he was giving talks, and, and now I've gotten to know him quite a bit. And he's become a friend. But to me, one of the most profound aspects of his experience was the panoramic holographic 360 degree life review right and this is when he says that there was a there was a being of light right it doesn't say it's an angel or it wasn't it was a being of light who was basically guiding him through what happened to him up to that point in his life and he replayed every single experience uh in like full color detail and more than that it felt like he was there but he had to experience it from the point of view of the other people that were that he was interacting with. And he had been a bit of a bully. He was a big kid, he used to beat up other kids, and he went in the military and said he actually shot people. And during his first life review in, in 1975, it was, I think, uh, he actually had to experience what it was like to have been beaten up by himself, right? And he realized not just the physical pain, but the emotions that the other people were going through. And, and, and what it was like to be shot and killed by him. But more than that, to see the ripple effect of that on that person's life, right? If somebody dies there, they may have a wife, they have parents, uh, siblings. What ripple effect does it have? So, you know, it was a basically the lesson of the life review as I take it is that, you know, this is how your actions ripple out. And so the life review is, is, is kind of giving you the purpose of life. It's how you're supposed to treat other people. Uh, and of course, this ties into karma. Well, when I was in Silicon Valley, you know, we were able to take a video game and record it, but we were also able to put on a virtual reality helmet. And we, we could see what it was like to if you were a video game character who shot another. We could replay that so it, you could actually see the bullet coming towards you. And so that was you know where this idea of the simulation and and recording because like, I'm I'm a scientifically minded guy, so if it's going to replay every scene, that scene, all that has to be recorded somewhere, and not just your scene, but the other people's scenes too, because sometimes the life review will will pull up these other you know well, what other people felt, uh, and it turns out in Islam uh, and even in the Bible there are recording angels, right? Recording angels depending on who you talk to and whether you're talking about the Bible or the Quran either just record the name of people who get into heaven or like in the Islamic traditions, the scroll of deeds and the recording angels have names and they're supposed to write down all your good deeds and your bad deeds. Well, now that's a metaphor, right? I mean, 2000 years ago, you could talk about angels writing stuff down. If today you were to say there's going to be, you know, you wouldn't say there's an angel for every person. There's like 7 billion times two, 14 billion angels. You would say that we're just going to record everything and then you're going to review it. Like, like you might at the end of a video game session. And, and so for me, you know, talking with Danny and, and hearing about his life review was a, an interesting link between my, my making that connection with what the religions have been telling us, what near-death experiencers have been telling us. And, and I do believe that they saw their life experiences, and I believe the life review is real, right? It's not just the neurons. Why? Firing because... Why do you believe that? See, th this is, again, yeah. back to the yeah. point, pushing back on Diana walsh Pasolka. Yeah. It doesn't matter yeah. if it's true or not. No, it does matter if it's well, true. Well, in this case, I think it we, does matter. <laughs> yeah. The reason that we care, the reason I care so much about near death experience science is I think it really paints the way forward. I, I'm not big on at the end when you go this kind of middle ground between science and spirituality. I, I think what we're headed towards is a post materialistic science, which embraces the science methods and, and it, the curiosity of science and the openness of science, but gets away from these falsified ideas. That's the important thing about near-death experience science is number one, 
We got Max Planck a hundred years ago saying consciousness is fundamental and everyone's sitting around are wringing their hands and going, is it really true? And then we have near-death experience science saying, oh, consciousness survives death. The most parsimonious explanation for that is consciousness is fundamental. And then the the other thing, you know, when I interview like a dear death experience researcher, they all say the same, but the one who says it most clearly is like Jeff Long, who has a database of 4,000 near death experience counts. And he says, Alex, you know, the one thing that gets kind of lost in this or one of the tunnels and life reviews and all the rest of this is back to your point earlier, back to Yogananda's point, love, 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 love. Yeah. 90%, something like 90% of the respondents say that is the most predominant, most important experience they get from the experience. So this is where I think science can lend a hand. And I think it merges perfectly with how we are to understand the most important things of what Yogananda is trying to tell us in the book. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, near-death experiences and near death science and even looking at you know when there's no brain activity for a period of time and the coherency of these experiences but also the message that they bring back right and so you know yogananda used uh, a uh, a metaphor of uh, a different metaphor than that was used in the past right in in the past like the buddhist traditions and even many of the hindu traditions use the idea that the world is like a dream and tibetan dream yoga is all about learning to do lucid dreaming, waking up in the dream so that you can do lucid dreaming while awake and realize that all of this is maya or illusion, right? And maya doesn't just mean illusion. It, it means carefully crafted illusion. Like when you go to see a magic show, you like like put out your disbelief so that you get entranced by the show. Or if you're you know watching a science fiction movie and you really want to get into it, you got to put aside your disbelief while you enjoy the actual world or the movie, but that the world is like that. And, you know, he had an experience where Yogananda had an experience where he was meditating and suddenly he was on a ship in World War One, a German guy, and he got shot and he felt what it was like to die. And he came back and tears were streaming from his eyes. And he was like, you know, Lord, why do you let me, why do you allow such suffering? And the answer that he got back very clearly was that, you know, life and death are relativities within the cosmic dream. Uh, that if you look at the newsreels of World War One, and you think of how movie projectors work, they're projecting the screen and you get so entranced by it that you think everything is real, but you forget there's a movie theater around you. And so he used the movie projector as his uh, you know, metaphor. And it was a new metaphor. It was using new technology at the time. Uh, and the world, he said, is made of light. Uh, and uh, and that, that, that science was also reaching this conclusion that, like there's a great, great quote from Autobiography of Yogi that I have in Wisdom of Yogi, which is, let it be from science then. Uh, if it must be so, let man learn that the philosophic truth that there is no material world. It's warp and woof is Maya. And I believe that, you know, near death experiences uh, are actually a great way for people to understand that consciousness is separate from the physical body. You know, and for me, since, since you know, we live in a world of the internet, social media and video games, uh, I like to use that, and I believe Yogananda would use more modern metaphors if he was around today. He wasn't a traditionalist. Like there were many traditionalists who ru he ruffled their feathers by teaching yoga to large groups of people and audiences using correspondence courses. Like these were things that were a big no-no in the in the yoga tradition in the past. I get all that, and I think yeah. that's important, and it ties back into this point we were talking about in terms of uh, technology. And also there's a pragmatism to Yogananda and it comes through in his biography uh, more than autobiography, but in his biography, yeah. he's like, okay, how do we get this done guys? I didn't come over here to learn the American, get it done ethos and then not to apply it. But I want to talk about metaphor because we talked about this last time you were on and we kind of don't exactly sync up on this. We've already used a bunch of metaphors. It's like a river. You know, life is like a river. It's like a dream. It's like a movie. Now, so video game. Okay. It's like a video game. Great. And that's your background. It's still a metaphor. I mean, it's metaphorical, right? And uh, I, I guess the reason that I kind of pull back on that and want to exaggerate that is, pull it up. And you alluded to this, but there's people out there that are 
they take it as way more than a metaphor. They take the simulation hypothesis and the idea that we might be in a video game as way, way more than a metaphor. And you mentioned uh, Nick Bostrom. We could also throw Elon Musk in there. And so that's really what you're kind of pushing against. And I kind of feel I want you to to come down one way or another on whether or not this is uh, truly metaphorical or if it is in some way somehow pointing towards something that is more than metaphorical? Well, I think it's both. I mean, the metaphor is the way into this, right? Like, I, I think if Yogananda were alive today, he would say, you know, it's like a movie, but it's like a stage play, but everybody has their scripts and they can make choices, but we're all playing it together, right? Shakespeare, in Shakespeare's time, the actors were called players, right? Uh, and we're all playing this together. And in the in Hindu traditions, the, the world is the lila or the divine play, the play of the gods or a stage play in a sense. So there's this multiple uses of this word play. Uh, and in the Quran, even they talk about, we have created this world for you as a pastime, as a game, as a sport. Right. And so these metaphors, I think are more than just metaphors, right? They are ways for us to understand something that's actually pretty profound but that's very difficult to express in words. Now, when it comes to the simulation me metaphor, I, I think the video game is the ultimate metaphor because there's a player and there's a character. So it gives that perfect sense of what's inside, what's outside, and the sense that everything around you is part of the illusion. Now, where I come down is, is you know, I, I, I got into this and we talked about this last time where I was playing a virtual reality ping pong game and it was so realistic that I decided, I tried to put the paddle down on the table. I tried to lean against the table and I almost fell over because there was no table. Uh, and so I projected where we're all, will our technology be? And the way that video games work is that they render based on information. And all my explorations into quantum physics hasn't convinced me that there is a material world. Basically, that the material world is information that gets rendered for each of us individually and for all of us together. And that's why I use the video game metaphor, as, but it's a little more than a metaphor because if we're taking information and we're actually rendering physical things around us, now that's a game and that's a simulation, but it's not like our laptops, right? Uh, our devices are not like our laptops. It's just so far more advanced than what we have available that when you say it's, you have to say it's a video game in a thousand years. And that's what, that's what Elon Musk was trying to say, right? It's no, no, yeah. I think they're saying something different. They're saying, that, I mean, you can't have it both ways. If it's more than a metaphor, it's not a metaphor. So well, when I yes, say but, when but I say life I, when yeah. I say life is like a river, there's yeah. no question that it's more metaphorical. And you couldn't push me. And I said, well, it's really more than a metaphor. You know, it's this. I'd say, right. no, it's it's just metaphorical. I, I go back to your definition of what yoga is. It's the mm -hmm. cessation of the whirlpools of thoughts and feelings in the river of consciousness. You're talking about God and divine here, right, Mister? MIT tech entrepreneur, you're way past any kind of Elon Musk simulation, you know, supercomputer kind of stuff. It, it, I don't think, I think we get into this kind of backdoor materialism where we kind of want to have it both ways. It's not Go just ahead. having it both ways. I mean, yes, that's part of it. But part of it is that we don't have the language, right, to express what these things really are. So we have to express them in, in language that we might actually understand, right? So imagine trying to explain video recording to someone 200 years ago. That's kind of what we're like today. We're trying to explain something that's profound and perhaps divine, and we're trying to explain it using the English language. You know, which I mean, we've done we, that we, though. We've done it successfully. You did it in your book. Yogananda yeah. did it in his book. There's been thousands of spiritual books and direct teachings right. throughout the ages that have explained it. We don't lack the language. We don't no, need. But, but, but Yogananda used metaphors, and and so did everybody exactly. else. And they're metaphors. They're he never says yeah. this is a little bit more than a metaphor. This is closer to it. We we don't need it by virtue of the fact that, well, again, your definition of yoga doesn't need any kind of MIT computer game understanding, forward-looking, deep sea. You know, it doesn't need any of that. <laughs> well, it depends who you talk to, right? Because it is a metaphor too. My definition is a metaphor, river of consciousness, right? That is a metaphor. And so, I, 
you know, that metaphor works for certain people, but it doesn't work for, for other people. And so, you know, we live, I mean, whether we like it or not, right, the dominant paradigm in our society today is the material. Is If you go back to Galileo's time, the dominant paradigm was a theological, religious, you know, Catholic church paradigm. And he was talking about things that seem to be outside of that dominant paradigm. But today, we're talking about things that are outside of the dominant paradigm. And so we have to somehow bridge the gap. And I see that as part of my part of my mission is to I see it as your mission. <laughs> I just think you should go about it more directly. What would Yogananda think about transhumanism and the transhumanist agenda? If you buy into that, I don't know how anyone cannot buy into that at this point, but what would what do you think Yogananda would say about that? Well, I, I think he would use, <laughs> you know, the modern technology as a way to talk about yoga and to get people interested in yoga techniques. That's exactly what he did back then, right? He talked about Einstein, relativity, talked about quantum mechanics and light and projection as a way to explain what, you know, the movie projector analogy and what what he had learned in, in his meditation. So I think today, like today, for example, okay, here's an example. I was at uh, uh, a, a little gathering at Arizona State University. And these were all kind of technology oriented, you know, academics. And and the the title of this talk or this this discussion group was, when will the first person live to be 150 years old? Like who will that person be? What what technologies will they because it's gonna happen soon, right? That was kind of the the the, the point. And I said, and I think Yogananda would do this exactly. And I said, I questioned the assumption that there's nobody that's lived to 150 already because, you know, there are tons of stories, not just like a few of people in the yogic traditions who've used yogic techniques to get there. And so, you know, I think Yogananda would say, you don't need transhumanism. You can get there using yoga, but he would use it to say, what is it you want transhumanism to do for you? Okay. This yoga can actually do that already and using, but he would call it a technology, right? See back then he called it the science of religion because that's, what was acceptable today, I think he would call it the technology of spirituality is what yoga, because today we all use technology so much more than we did back then, that I think people understand that 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 idea much more. And, and he would say yoga is a kind of technology. So Riz, in the book, Wisdom of a Yogi, you do a terrific job of kind of your mission from the beginning is pulling out these various accounts and turning them into lessons that have a pragmatic, real-world kind of application. What are some of the lessons that are really resonating with people? Sure, I'll tell you a couple. The first lesson in the book is called You Don't Have to Go to the Himalayas. And, you know, Yogananda spent a lot of his boyhood, he had a vision uh, of these these kind of meditating swamis in the mountains. And he said, who are you? And they said, we are the swamis of the Himalayas. And it was such a strong vision that he knew right then and there he wanted to be a monk, right? And so he had this vision of the future. So he spent his childhood trying to run away from home, <laughs> run away from Calcutta to go to the Himalayas and find a guru to the point where he was in high school. He and his buddies got on the trains. They, you know, put on European clothes and there was this chase across Northern India because his older brother would always go and fetch him back because you're too young to have run away, you know? And so he had to promise his father, he would, you know, at least graduate high school before he went off. <laughs> right. And so in the end, you know, he did eventually leave Calcutta and tried to go to one of these holy places. But when he met his guru, he ended up being in Serampur, which is only 12 miles from Calcutta where he had grown up. And so, you know, the lesson there is you don't always have to go someplace far away to find your spiritual practice or your mission in life. And, you know, I interviewed people and this happened with Steve Jobs. First of all, he went all the way to India uh, I forget, and he went in, into uh, you know his little hostel room where he was staying, and somebody had left a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi. And then when he came back, that became the book that he read every year. Now he wasn't necessarily you know a disciple per se; it was just that he believed in the stories and what they were trying to say about consciousness. I mean, he did more Zen meditation than anything, right? In terms of you know his actual practice. But but he went so far away. And I, I remember interviewing a, a guy named Peter, who was a Hollywood producer. And he went all the way to Rishikesh uh, and back in, I don't know, the 80s, I think it was. And, and he went there and he went to a bookstore and he found Autobiography of a Yogi. And he looks at the picture of, you know, Yogananda's got this kind of 
this very serene face with his eyes that are kind of glowing. And he goes, wait, I've seen that picture before. And it was in the, the LA Times newspaper. And turns out there was a, you know, a Yogananda Center, like right down the road from where he lived in Hollywood. And that became his spiritual practice. And so we always think we have to go somewhere else, but start with where you are uh, and, 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 and you will find things around you that speak to you. And even in my case, you know, I found, you know, some teachers early on that helped me uh, with different aspects of, 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 of consciousness. And it was right there in Boston, right around MIT where I was. Um, and so that's one of the lessons. Uh, another important lesson is sometimes the universe gives you a task uh, and ready or not, that is your task to do. And you might not feel the best qualified to do that task. So when Yogananda was asked to come to America in 1920, he was a young, he's a pretty young Swami. He wasn't like, you know, the Yogananda, the Guruji that everybody thinks about today. Uh, and he had, he rarely ever gave talks except to some kids. Uh, he had a school for kids that he set up and he had never given a talk in English. Now think about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, he was asked to go represent the Hindu religion in America, in Boston at this, this religious conference. And, and yet, even though he wasn't the most qualified, he had this intuition these clues, just like he had this in the intuition earlier, I mentioned that he would be a wandering monk. Now, in that case, we often get these visions of our future. Like if you had asked me in high school, what are you going to do in life? I said, oh, I'm going to be a software entrepreneur and then I'm going to be a writer. Now, how did I know that? I feel like there's a script that we have written for ourselves, but it's a broad script. In Yogananda's case, he became a wandering monk, just not wandering around the Himalayas. He was wandering all around America, and that's where he spent you know, most of his time. And so I feel like we get the essence of these things, but we may get the details wrong. Uh, and then sometimes we're called to do something we don't feel qualified. And Yogananda didn't feel qualified, but he had a vision of these people that he took to be Americans. And uh, that was an inner, inner vision. And then it was accompanied by an outer invitation, like someone actually invited him after he had that vision, and he realized... That's what my vision was telling me, that I need to go to America. And there were all kinds of obstacles to him getting here. Like it was World War I was just finished. And, and he literally had, had to find the first boat out of India. He didn't have a visa. He didn't have, a, you know, it was full. He didn't have a ticket. He didn't have any money. His father didn't want him to go. I mean, it was just like all these things. And eventually they all kind of melted to get melted out of the way. And, you know, he ended up going to America and, and, and doing very well in that talk. And, you know, tying back to my earlier story about when I was asked to write this book, I did at first, my first thought was, you know, I, I don't feel qualified to be the one to write this book. But then the more I thought about it, the more I realized there was, this was a task. It was literally placed in front of me out of all my books, right? This is the only one where literally it was like somebody came to me in HarperCollins, India, in this case, and said, we want you to write this book. Uh, so it was a different experience for me, right? And and I'm not, you know, necessarily shy about, uh, I think I can accomplish a lot of things, but but I had doubts as well, you know? And, and so as part of that, uh, I, I wanted to go and see where Yogananda wrote uh, his book. Uh, and it was in Encinitas, right? Not far from, from where you are. And it was overlooking the Pacific Ocean and what's called Swami's Beach now. And it was during COVID. And, uh, you know, I wasn't able to, uh, you know, it wasn't open to the public, but Luckily, SRF opened it just for me and gave me a nice private tour during a time when I was still trying to find the inspiration to write this book. And I went in uh, to 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 his office uh, with a couple of months and I was able to stay there as long as I wanted. And, you know, you open the doors and right there is overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And, and I meditated and, and I had a vision while I was there. And I very clearly saw Yogananda there with a stack of papers on his book, which I assumed was his writing of like the autobiography. And to my horror, he took this stack. He looked at me almost mischievously, honestly. He took it out the the, the, the French doors and he threw it, threw the papers off to the wind in the Pacific. And I was like horrified. Like, what are you doing as a writer? Like, especially in those days, you didn't have, you know, <laughs> backup on this. Now, Riz, I, I don't want you to kind of breeze past this non-ordinary experience because at one hand, you're saying very ordinary stuff like the folks from SRF let you in and a lot of people can go now and tour it and they've left it all like it is. And there's some weirdness about the SRF folks, but won't go there. But you have, make sure we get this, you have a non-ordinary experience, an encounter with 
in your understanding of it, Yogananda in this extended consciousness realm, which is just a placeholder because we don't even know what that is. But that's what you're talking about here. Yeah. I mean, it's, I was meditating in the room, you know, with my eyes closed and I, it was a spontaneous vision. And, and I consider it to have been, uh, you know, an actual connection with the spirit of Yogananda. Now it's a vision that was tailored to me because I'm a writer, right? And I was there seeking inspiration for my writing. Uh, and so, so then I saw him throw off these, you know, these papers and I, I was like, they're going to go everywhere in the Pacific. And then all the papers turn into little white doves <laughs> and took it out. And he's like turning to me and he says, you see your pages, the message, they carry the message long after you're gone. And that's why you have to write this book. And so it, it kind of helped me, uh, you know, one, not be, not hold on so tightly to this idea, but to let go a little bit, but two, to realize that there, this was a task that the universe had given to me and that, that I could accomplish it. Uh, thinking about Yogananda's own life and what he accomplished, uh, you know, over so many years. Uh, and, and so, so that was a non-ordinary experience that I had, you know, while writing this book. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So that's another lesson. And if we have time, I'll give you one more, which is that sometimes, you know, setbacks are part of your path, right? Because it's easy for us, you know, do you hear these stories about whether it's a successful author or a guru like Yogananda, especially with Yogananda, and he tells all these miraculous stories. And you think, well, the guy didn't have any problems, right? Wow, it was just a magical life. It was divine intervention and all this stuff happened. But, you know, one of the things that I really learned in, from his biography looking at his life in addition to his book was you know he had setbacks like everybody else in fact he had a pretty major setback uh after he had been in in um u.s for 15 years his his he had brought his buddy swami Dirananda over uh and there you know he was teaching a lot of the classes while yogananda was traveling out everywhere and you know they had this big scandal that came up uh where some some guy thought his wife was having an affair or doing something nefarious with Swami Durananda. And he supposedly went up and hit, you know, he, he punched him on the nose. And this became like a huge media storm. Like if you think of what we call a viral story today, like all the Hearst newspapers, you know, were, were spreading this story. Hindu Swamis are taking American women. And, you know, and this is back in the 1920s, right? Or in the early 1930s. Uh, and, you know, Yogananda had to be pulled from my, his Miami lectures. There were all these guys that were going to physically beat him up. Um, and, 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 and after that, you know, Swami Dharananda left and uh, took, took, you know, a lot of people from Yogananda's organization. And it kind of fell apart. You know, a lot of things fell apart for him. And, and it was almost... Like he wasn't sure what to do next. And he went to Mexico and meditated and he was kind of praying, you know, please let me just go back to India. Like, you know, all this craziness here and all this effort in the West, maybe I'm not meant to be here. You know, and he clearly got the message that he still had work to do here. But that setback was a key part of how he spent the next, you know, 20 years of his life uh, while he was alive, which is he started teaching a smaller number of students and then he started thinking of ways to get his work out there. And he spent the last almost 15 years of his life, or maybe not last, but 15 years, writing Autobiography of a Yogi. And he realized that that was what was going to spread his message. And so, so this idea that if you have a major setback, that that by itself uh, is a problem is, is, is not necessarily true. The setbacks may be part of our story. If he hadn't had that setback, he may not have spent so much time writing this book. He would have spent more time teaching and building the organization and doing all these other things he'd been doing for the past, you know, so many years. And, and, you know, something like that happened to me in my own life. And I talk about it in the book where, you know, I was kind of at the height of my, you know, career as an entrepreneur, having sold multiple companies, became a venture capitalist. I was running a startup program at MIT. And then I had, you know, some health problems. I literally had to have heart surgery triple bypass. And that, you know, right and right before I was to give the big talk at the end of our Play Labs Accelerator at MIT. And that was like a major setback. Um, and uh, basically it meant that, you know, I couldn't do anything for a while. And I was literally stuck at home uh, for many months and I had to keep going back to the hospital. And every time I would start to recover and I think I'm going to jump back in the business world, things would go south again. And, and that's when I realized that the message that, that I was being given 
pretty clearly during during right after the surgery and afterwards was that I had spent too much time in the business world fighting what I like to call our outer tigers, uh, referencing the story of the tiger Swami. Uh, the tiger Swami had spent a lot of his life, you know, out battling these these tigers, physically fighting these tigers. And at one point, he got a message that it was enough. Now he should start focusing on his inner tigers of doubt and his fears and his desires and focus on it. And he actually got the message from his father through a, a Swami and he didn't listen. And he ended up getting mauled by this one tiger in his last fight. And it literally took him six months. And if you've ever seen anybody get heart surgery, and I was never mauled by a physical tiger, but <laughs> it felt very similar. Like they cut you up completely, open you up, and then you got to get back together. And it took me about six to nine months to recover. And then after that, I realized that the message I was given was that it was time for me to get on with the second part of my life, my career, which is to be a writer. And that's when I focused on my writing. Uh, and that's, you know, the Tiger Swami then decided he had no, you know, he had no more interest. He had fought his outer tigers and there's nothing wrong with that. I had fought my outer battles in the business world. And that's part of your karma. It's the stuff that you're drawn to. Uh, but then sometimes it takes a major setback to course correct you, to then get on with it and say, okay, you fought your outer tigers. Now it's time to fight We your inner tigers. And for me, it was to put down all this stuff that I had been thinking about and I knew I was going to be a writer. Uh, and so the lesson is setbacks may be part of your story. Take them in stride and understand that they may have meaning well beyond the physical, the physical thing or, or, or the obstacle that gets in your path. Fantastic. And at Riz, you know, as we move to wrap this up, if people do go to zenentrepreneur.com, they're going to find all your books there. What else are they going to find? Links to my podcast, a uh, lot to my articles that I've written on a bunch of different topics, you know, uh, science fiction, on uh, spirituality, on uh, simulation. Where else would we direct people on this zenentrepreneur.com? Uh, well, you got a lot of good stuff on entrepreneur stuff. Yeah, I got a lot of entrepreneurship articles. I mean, that was my day job, right? It was to, as an entrepreneur uh, for many years and as an venture capitalist and investor. And I wrote a book called Startup Myths and Models, which is a kind of a collection of lessons that I learned over 20 plus years of, of being in Silicon Valley and being an entrepreneur and all the myths that people have about how startups work. Uh, and so you can download, you know, free chapters from pretty much you know most of these books on my website. And so there's also a podcast called The Simulated Universe, where I interviewed a number of other folks uh, who have explored this idea. Um, and then you've got videos. Some of my videos are up there as well, uh, including, I think, links to like my talk at Google. Um, here you can see some articles I wrote for Stanford and a few other places. And so there's, there's, there's quite a bit there. And there's even a couple of my UFO articles as you mentioned as well. And then there's my blog on Medium, which I haven't been updating as much lately, but there's quite a few articles that I put up on that over time as well. So it's been absolutely fantastic having you on. Again, the book you're going to want to check out, Wisdom of a Yogi, Lessons for Modern Seekers from Autobiography of a Yogi. Riz, thanks again so much. Best of luck with the book. I I, I think it's going to sprout wings, just like your apocryphal story said, and you never know where it's going to go. But this is the kind of book that if you pick it up, there's no doubt going to be some stuff I think that's going to resonate with you right where you are right now, because it kind of talks again, all these different lessons. One of them is going to hit you right with right what you need at the moment, I have a feeling. So thanks again. Thanks so much for having me back on. Thanks again to Riz Verk for joining me today on Skeptico. The question I tee up from this interview is, have you read Autobiography of a Yogi? And what did you think about the book? What lessons did you learn? Let me know your thoughts. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.